Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today. Uh, you are uh, watching our latest session, which is around the art of recycling. So what that means basically is lots of organizations have a lot of data, some they're using today, some that is very, very old and they're not using. So we're going to talk about how to manage that data in uh, better ways and also reuse that information that could be used as a knowledge base to your organization as well while keeping in mind things around compliance and data security. So before we get into that, uh, let's just do a little bit of housekeeping. So if you've got any questions, feel free to use the uh, Q&A button at the very top of Teams. The session is recorded today, so we'll be able to share that out on our Quorum Cyber website. So we'll send you a link to that. The slides will also be available as well. But as always, if you've got any burning questions, let us know. That's great, we're always listening. So this is part of a series that we're running through. Uh, we're on number three now. Can you believe, Becky? Um, one more to go, which is in a couple of weeks time around a structured data as well. So if you're not signed up for that yet, go ahead to the link at the top of this page and uh, register up today. As we said, uh, this is your first time looking at the series. I'm Graham Hosking, one of the solution directors here at Quorum Cyber, uh, aligned to data security and artificial intelligence. That includes things like Copilot from Microsoft, also followed by my esteemed uh, specialist from Microsoft, Becky. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so hi, I'm Becky Chorton. So I'm a data security technical specialist, and I'm here to support Graham today. Lovely. Thank you, as always. So the agenda, uh, the next sort of 40 minutes, we're hoping uh, we're going to be talking about kind of understanding where your data is, what some of the, the biggest challenges are, and then how we can use technology to understand that data a lot better than we do today. Things like automation come into that as well. So of the data that we have, how can we understand it and provide data about the data? Um, how can we go through and visualize those benefits to our end users? So if they're working with an Outlook or Teams, how can we better use that information and surface that up appropriately? We'll talk about two different um, technologies today, actually three different technologies today, which is Microsoft Syntax, Viva Topics, and Microsoft 365 Copilot. And why it's really important to look at these different technologies, especially if you're thinking about adopting things like generative AI or when Copilot gets released, there's some really important readiness that you need to do because you don't want to surface up all and any information to your employees. So it's quite important to do uh, that kind of uh, triage process to see, have we got the right security in place? Are we making sure that our data is also aligned to different regulations as well? So we're here into that. And uh, last but not least, we'll do uh, some final Q&A at the very end. So some of the biggest challenges that we hear from every organization today is a lot of data is being created, not just within the Microsoft platform, but also in their line of business applications. They might be using IoT, so that's also generating information as well. They need to adhere to things like GDPR, different classifications to ensure that they're not over um over keeping information can't think of that word right now um, but hoarding information forever is not a good thing you know there's organizations out there that are spanning sort of 20 or 30 years worth of data because they're just too scared to delete anything because they don't know what it is you know so discovering that data can be really hard for them but there are a set of tools within the microsoft space that can help organizations discover the information they have on premises, in the line of business applications, or even structured data as well. So if they're using things like SAP or Oracle or AWS, like non-Microsoft platforms, we can also use the Microsoft technologies to scan and discover that data as well in a cohesive way. So having a portal to understand where all that information lives, do that data map mapping exercise, um, and then being able to have a defined process in order to cull that information or reclassify that information going forward. What's your thoughts on that, Becky? 
Yeah, no, we see it all the time because in fairness with a lot of this, even if in the best instance you had all your policies set up, you have that visibility of that data. A lot of the time you're then, well, what what do I do then? You know, maybe I have retention in place, but I don't know how much of this is valuable to me, how much of it is business critical data, how much of this I could potentially still use. So with the context of having, you know, historic data, a lot of it is still saying, well, it still is relevant to me. It still is important to the organisation, but I have no idea how important it is. And, you know, are people still using it? So it's kind of coming from that instance of being able to bring those analytics to the front and being able to learn from it as well. Yeah. What, what types of data are you speaking to customers about at the moment? What, what seems to be the, the majority of the data that they're holding on to? It is general, just unstructured data, you know, that legacy data, project documents, so, you know, even to the likes of old emails which have been sent out, you know, 10 years ago or so. They mm. just haven't got round to adding those retentions, being able to get rid of it. But at the same time, you, you know, you have your financial documents, being able to define how long to keep all this data is very, you know, context, I can't say the word, specific, it's very um, organisationally driven. And if that process hasn't been defined, understandably, you just keep everything, so. Yeah, you do. So, like I said, this is, uh, we've ca captured this in a couple of the other sessions that we've done. Like, it's super critical for organisations to jump on this now and not to use, like, third-party archiving because it just makes the problem even worse. Um, and then some of those other vendors will hold those organizations to ransom if they ever want to take that data out. So it's always something to check, especially if you want to sign up or you need to sign up for a third party backup or archiving solution. If you're, you've got a regulator that's uh, mandating that, great, you know, you might have to go away and do that. But using the Microsoft tools and the built-in capabilities means that you know, you can still keep that data if you need to, but there might be better ways of classifying that data and then moving it to um, an in-place archive within the platform or using some of the new capabilities that we'll talk about in a little bit. I also want to kind of bring it back to this. Sorry, Becky, do you have something? I was just going to add another point of, you know, not only keeping and archiving that data, but the more data you build up, the more data you always hoard, the greater you're at risk from a cybersecurity point of view. As you know, in the worst case instance, say, you know, you lost all your data, you've, you've been hacked and there has been a breach, the more sensitive data that, you know, the larger scale business critical data you keep hold of, the more access potentially, more, the greater scale of data loss it can occur. So it's about establish or establishing and evaluating that risk as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I bring this up as well. You know, it's mm. not just discovering that data, but also there's ways of protecting it. Mm. Uh, so discovering data, protecting or making sure it's not overshared, making sure you're not breaking those organizations from working or the day-to-day -day work uh, and use of that data, but also keeping a closer eye on sort of those contextual insights that end users doing. So great, they're, they're empowered to work from home, uh, allowed to work on different types of information or confidential information at home, but if they start to kind of stray from the norm and now being very risky to the business, being able to surface those types of risks up as well. Uh, and like you were saying, Becky, you know, it's um, making sure you, you protect that data from a cybersecurity point of view, but also go back to different assessments or different baselines that your organization needs to adhere to and then use that as a framework in order to adopt these technologies and changes within the business. And when we go back to sort of data management, we really should think about it as like a layered approach. Like just dumping files in SharePoint and hoping for the best isn't the right thing to do. Um, and like I said, a lot of organizations are just keeping everything forever. They do have a retention schedule that's written down on a bit of paper somewhere, but they sort of ignore it. Um, they may find that when they're trying to search within OneDrive or SharePoint for the relevant information, it's just impossible for them to surface that up. And that could be a multitude of reasons. Like there's just so much data, you know, or, you know, it wasn't the data was called something else back 10 years ago. We're like, how do you find that information or know, even if the person is still here, they created it, right? Mm. Uh, when we talk about sort of permissions, like Microsoft's recommendation for SharePoint is a flat uh, structure using 365 groups. 
Um, so making sure that you have the right approach when it comes to permissions and security within these platforms is key. So when we're talking about that business content, this kind of light colored big uh, orb that you're seeing on the screen here, we want to think about the classification of the data. What's the data type? Like, should it be classified as in, is it sensitive or not? Um, we need to think about archiving. So we're not keeping everything forever, but there's a flow, a process of eventually deleting that data defensively, which is, I think is key. And then kind of search and knowledge also feed into that as well. So of the data that we have, why do we reuse that data? It seems crazy to have your employees like uh, updating documentation or doing orders or contracts and then filing them away that nobody else can see. Mm. That's something that is business sensitive as in it can be shared within the business. Great, you know, make it visible. If it's a project that you're working on that is super secret, maybe it's a mergers and acquisitions, then we want to secure that within the business. So any, just not anybody can access that information, but really the, the tented people, right? So we're, we're building this intelligent platform using these different layers. And that's what the session is about today. And really the content from my perspective or everyone's perspective, I think, <laughs> is it's, it is the lifeblood because that data contains your business critical information, your IP that you've created, like how do you run the business, um, customer data, financial information, technical designs, like I could go on. It's really the, the crown jewels that you're putting into these platforms. So how do we manage that? Mm. A couple of different stats. Um, like the kind of through line of this is the data growth isn't going to stop. It's just going to get bigger. So if you think about 83 million documents per hour, I don't know if you can type that fast, Becky. I said, but if you've got a massive business creating this content on a daily basis, you know, there has to be different measures in place and control around just the aspects of classifying that data or pulling the metadata out so we can find that information, right? It's going to be critical or is critical to everyone. I've got organizations today that I speak to that are buying more uh, storage for SharePoint, not on like a monthly basis or a yearly basis, but on nearly on a weekly basis. And they're saying it's costing us tons. We, we don't know what to do. Do we go out to a third party and back up our data there and then we can't access it? So we put it in Azure, but then, you know, we, we can search it because Microsoft Search can do that, by the way. Um, but then we lose things like um, like retention. We can't put retention policies over in Azure. So how do we manage that? So there's, there's lots of different issues that customers are, are calling us about, and Microsoft, of course, <laughs> about how do they deal with those challenges. So the idea is to have that layered approach that we just talked about, a centralized platform that can do the automation for you. Mm -hmm. There's no good speaking to your end users saying, that's great that you've created all those documents or those millions of documents per hour, put them in that folder, like this extra overhead and training for those end users. So we want to build a platform that can identify that content, what it contains, like enrich that data, either pulling out metadata, so metadata is data about data, if you didn't already know, or even put data into the content, which we'll show you in some of the demos in a second. If there's a contract I want to fill out very quickly. Why not reuse the information you already have and automation to create that for you? It's still human centric. You're still checking that, but we can have automation and AI machine learning built in to help them as end users yeah i mean it's all about just using what you already have and at the end of the day people you know it's not their jobs to categorize it's not their, they're not particularly going to care about how long this data is going to be kept for for all they care about is in their one drive they're using it it's not their issue and um, but when it comes to them being able to pull out analytics, being able to go search, being able to reuse that data, it becomes hugely helpful. It's not, because not only is it expensive to keep hordes of data, but it's also impractical and inefficient. So it's about being yes. able to guide through that. I worked with uh, an organization last year 
and they were using a third party document storage, but it was mandatory for every user once they put some document up there or record up there to fill out a very large metadata column of fields like what's it for, what department, you know, date, time, everything before they could save the document. And then the end user was just coming back saying, I just don't have time for this. So they wouldn't put it in there. <laughs> they put it somewhere else. So not only now have you got this very expensive third party um, records management solution, but then you've got kind of SharePoint or OneDrive or Box or Dropbox because the end users are going to go somewhere else to store their data. And then you've got another big kind of shadow IT issue then as well. Mm. Or worst case scenario, they dump it onto their local machine and don't have like the OneDrive sync working and then the machine crashes and you've lost data. So there's there's lots of reasons why. Um, so there's just some of the things that we're seeing uh, with the users today. When it comes to Microsoft's solution around this called Microsoft Syntax, the idea being that you you don't necessarily need to care where you're putting that content. You need to put it in SharePoint and OneDrive. Um, but you're able to use uh, models of data to understand what that data contains. So if it's a contract, we can teach the system, hey, these are all my quorum cyber contracts. This is what it looks like. These are the templates we use. And if you see something like that, then automatically you should be able to apply a classification or a retention label to that, and then automatically put it into a folder if you work in that way. If you don't use folders, by the way, that's fine. You can use metadata then to use different views. So you can use models to create a view based on the information you want to see. So just an example for a second, you know, you're in a SharePoint site, you have a list of hundreds of files. So you can use different views to just filter on the content type of contracts. Um, there's no need for folders these days. We can extract data from that content as well. So if we think about a contract for a second, you know, it's going to contain the customer name, the contract number, the dates, the addresses. We can pull all of that out as metadata into columns, into SharePoint, and then we can use Microsoft Syntax then to search that metadata, which is another metric. The reason why we talked about data security in the very beginning is now we know even more about the data. Um, we can automatically classify that data or understand where it's traversing through the network or outside to your partners. And especially when it comes to things like AI and Microsoft 365 Copilot, which we'll talk about at the very end, like being able to secure and only surface up the information using uh, this technology is, is going to be kind of formidable in, in adopting those technologies going forward. Also having a way to sort of analyze and gain insights about who's using that data. Like uh, that's another question I get is great. We don't know where anything lives. We don't know who the data owners are. Uh, we can't classify it because we don't know anything. So being able to gain those insights automatically from the platform, I think is also crucial. So understanding how all that data is, like what's the makeup of that data type, um, all of this solution can do as well. So it's really managing that content at scale, and let's show you uh, what that means. But before we go into that, I wanted to just highlight some newer capabilities from Microsoft that's brought in to address some of the issues I've just talked about. So now there's Syntax Backup and Syntax Archive. So Backup allows you to do like a point in time restore of your content, which is pretty neat. Meaning that if you're using some third party backup solutions, because you think 365 is not resilient enough or doesn't back up your data, then there's capabilities in here to give you very granular recovery of that information. Um, we've talked about in the past and previous sessions as well around retention. So making sure that you've got retention policies up. So if somebody accidentally deletes, deletes something, you can retrieve it back. Now we've got the capability to go in and actually retrieve individual files where we really couldn't do that before without uh, a little bit of overhead. A lot of organizations still have third party archiving, predominantly around email, uh, where they've moved from different platforms over the years. Obviously they keep everything forever. 
Um, but for those customers that want to uh, negate the need for that technology, and then just you move to Microsoft, but have a, a strategy of archiving data off and then putting it somewhere, but having the capability to bring it back if they need to, Syntex Archive allows you to do that. So under the covers is using uh, Azure containers, storage there, but we can fine tune the policies in the platform that can move certain sites and move sites back if we need to going forward. So a um, bit of a kind of a takeaway set of slides really, but it gives you a bit more information about how we're protecting the information that you put within the M365 platform and then also being able to scale that. So you don't have to go away and buy a ton of SharePoint online storage necessarily. Should we go to the demo, Becky? I think so. You should. Be helpful. So now we know a little bit more about what Syntex is there to do. Let's go through a bit of a demo about what it looks like from an end user perspective. So we can see we're in a SharePoint site. Uh, we can see quite a lot of metadata that's uh, over here in columns like image tags and manufacturer and so on and so forth. Um, but let's have a quick look into this and see what we got. So first document we've got in that library is a solar panel, lovely. Um, I can see there's some image tags as well. Uh, it's automatically brought up that there's it's a solar panel, so I can use that as metadata if I need to to search it. Well, um, skip next. I was going uh, to say, just then, you could also see who has access to that document as well. Indeed, yeah, exactly. So when it comes to things like Copilot later on, we want to make sure that all the sharing links are going to the appropriate people, and there's not any like spurious sharing links that just allows anyone to click on it um, outside of your organization, which is uh, also key. This uh, looks like an offer letter. Can you read some of this to me, Becky? It looks like a combination of Spanish and Latin. I was thinking, I think it might be Spanish and French, but I, I can't say I'm French. fluent either. <laughs> I can barely speak English, so <laughs> it's definitely difficult for me. Let's, let's change that, shall we? Let's, let's go back to the document library. It looks like from the file names, they're all in a different language that unfortunately I don't speak. But what we can do is select all those files and a very handy button called translate. And it'll automatically pick up that French or Latin or Spanish, uh, Spanish uh, uh, language and then put it into the language that I want. So like I said, I, I can just about speak English. Evidently not today though. <laughs> And I can automatically uh, translate that content and it creates a new folder for me with all of the uh, transcribed documents in it. So now I can actually read this. So I can see it's a bid. Uh, I can see there's a bid opening date, some other metadata, closing date, contract person, contact person, manufacturer, supplied units, delivery date. OK, that looks cool. So I can read this now. But it looks like it's a pretty long document, so I can use Microsoft Syntax to summarize what's in this document. I don't have to spend the next hour trying to read it. So it gives me the highlights, but also gives me a link then to where that, uh, that summarization is within the document. So if I click on View Document, it gives me the extract of that information. So it's using um, some AI in that to read the document for me, index it, and then surface that information up. I was going to say this would be particularly helpful if let's say you're working on a project together internally and they just need to have a summary of what the document you're about to send them is. You've got that information all there. So it's exactly. definitely time saving. Well, this is where generative AI is really coming in. If you've not played with um, Teams Premium yet, where we can record the call and at the end of the call, it's summarizing all of the insights, all of the actions, and then who's going to go away and do the actions automatically for you. Um, if you're not used to things like ChatGPT or any sort of generative AI, this is it. This is what it does for you. Saves a lot of time. We can also see in here that um, I can click on new and then pick up different, uh, different templates, if you like. So I've got a content type in here as a response letter to that order that we just saw. Now, what I would typically do if I didn't have this technology is open word, probably 
look for the company header and then start filling out the document manually. With Microsoft Syntax, we can bring up the document, which is a template, but then have this view over on the right-hand side where we can automatically fill out the metadata that will populate that form. So like I said earlier on, we can use this technology to not just extract the information like this billing date and a summary of what it is and the solicitation number. We can also get that data and input it into the templates as well, which is pretty neat. So we can yeah. fill all that out. Oh, this is particularly helpful and you know you you know you work with a large number of forms in your organization a large number of these forms have some form of standard form standard new template which you typically reuse you know it's far more yeah. visible i know within my environment where i do quite a lot of proposals like mm. from a managed services point of view it's the same thing there might be some terms and conditions to change but if it's a pro just a, a draft proposal going to a customer necessary doesn't have to be changed but it has to be customized with the relevant information for that new potential customer so there's a way of doing that so if we can fill that out we've got a new pdf now with our agreement in there that didn't have all the information i needed though becky i'm afraid so what i'm going to need to do is get a collection of these documents um, what we can do is um before we do that we've automatically moved that file into the right place for me automatically. It's pretty neat. So we can use Power Automate to do that in the background. And then um, what we can do, we need to get this signed before we get the other documents. So let's do that. Let's so we'll open up that agreement. If we click on the ellipsis at the very top here, we can start to merge this uh, with other PDFs. So I've got my agreement. There's two other documents I need to pull in as well. So there's this uh, standard process. And there's also something else I needed, which I'm going to just save here for a second. And now we can see the very bottom that is actually merging those two PDFs together. And now it's ready. OK, now I'm ready for my signature. Sorry. <laughs> so. As it's kind of built into Microsoft Syntax, we can use a combination of different technologies. Now, Microsoft Syntax has eSignature built into it, which is pretty neat. But if you're using things like DocuSign or Acrobat Sign, you can use those as well. But as we're here, let's use Syntax, shall we, to actually sign this, this legal document. So we're going to put in Brian as one of the signatures and Nesta. Notice Brian is outside of the organization as well. And we're just going to write a small kind of note within here that they need to sign it by the end of the week. Thank you very much. And hit send. So what's going to happen is um, that external person, Brian, is going to get an email to sign this document. And we can do this very, very quickly. We don't have to use other tools or drag things into Outlook and then send it that way. It's all built in. But I want Brian specifically to sign this part of the document so they don't get confused. And I also want Nesta to sign the other side so I can template that. So when they get sent to them, they know where to go. And the agreement is sent. Lovely, thanks very much. So now we can see what the recipient gets. So they got a new email. Uh, we can see the attachment here. Notice that it is a, uh, a modern attachment as well. What other things can you see on the screen here, Becky? I can see some security stuff. Well, yeah, it, it's automatically encrypted and sent, well, applied some form of sensitivity labeled at highly confidential recipients. So going back to what we were mentioning earlier about, you know, building out your data security program, being able to like ensure there's a level of protection on that data. Um, as form of classification, it does this automatically. So similar to the likes of Adobe Acrobat um, or DocuSign, all the content which gets sent over is automatically encrypted. And when it comes to the likes of, you know, enforcing classification across your organization and getting that visibility, this helps tie it into that as well. So this isn't a separate solution. It is native to Microsoft um, or okay. Microsoft infrastructure. And it's persistent with the document as well, with the email and the document. So when it gets full circle and all gets signed, that metadata is with the document. 
And guess what? We can use things like e-discovery to then surface up that information, or we can use search then to also bring that up as well. It was all built in. Lovely. Let's go into this document then. We're going to double click on the attachment here. Notice that it's opened it up in another pane. So it's not another copy of the contract. Um, it's actually going securely into um, the sender's tenant. And then there's one single file of this contract. So no longer do you have to have like the 55, 55th version of the document. We're using built in uh, versioning within SharePoint and OneDrive, uh, which is up to uh, 50 iterations. And then it's major versions. So we can go in, we know where to click because that's where it said. We can actually scribe on the screen if we've got a, a Microsoft Surface. Um, and then we can sign it and add the signature. Lovely. So the sender now gets a message back saying, well, you've signed the document. Thanks very much. That automatically gets applied back into, or those changes get applied back into the SharePoint site. Because remember, you know, we've only got one version of the document, which is neat. And I know where to go. We can also build in things like approval processes uh, or other kind of workflows in uh, Power Automate as well. So if you wanted that to go to uh, the next stage of uh, procurement or some other method that you want to notify somebody, you can do that also. So you may have noticed on the screen here that it says that there's one model applied. So that's where we're using things like um, machine learning to understand the content that I want to see. So like I said before, if there's just contracts I want to see on the screen as a view, we can apply these models of data to the view that I'm seeing. So I can filter it in that way, which is pretty neat. Because Microsoft Syntax is able to pull out that metadata, like I said, we can see things like manufacturer and panel efficiency and regions across here. Wouldn't it be cool if it was built into search, uh, and which it is. So Syntax allows you to have custom views so I can put in the manufacturer and the region of the content that I'm trying to find and then surface up the two documents that I'm interested in. That's pretty neat. We're now able to find the information that is kind of pertinent and actually saving time and money in my day to day job, which is perfect. We can also scribe on the screen as well. So annotations in Microsoft Syntax allow you to create notes either for yourself or if you're collaborating with your team. So we can highlight different things on the screen here. Um, it doesn't save the annotation onto the original document, but it just allows me to kind of pinpoint and mark out things for myself or my team on that, which is also really useful as well. So we've quickly talked about the importance of data. Uh, how do we manage and control that data automatically? How can we enrich our end users in actually finding the information? But I, this really kind of ties into knowledge as well. So as I mentioned, lots of organizations are keeping a lot of really good data, but people aren't able to find it. Wouldn't it be cool if we were able to surface up that content as and when they're writing a document or an email saying, hey, there's other related stuff over here. And uh, John or Becky are able to give you more information on that so we can find the experts in the business that deal with it. The reason why this technology has come about is, you know, there's lots of different use cases that you can think of, whether it's people that have been there forever um, and they're creating a lot of really good content, but nothing gets reused or discovered. Uh, new people coming to the business aren't able to understand or even find the information. I worked with a um, similar organization last year where they wanted to create an operating model of how the business ran. So they were going to go out and buy a bespoke solution that basically mapped all this out for them. So we can use Viva Topics to do something very similar. So it looks at the correlation of the content that we just discovered, right? And then reusing the, the metadata, the data about the data, to be able to surface that up as knowledge to our end users. And oh, by the way, if they don't have access to particular very sensitive business information, then they can't find it. So we're hiding that type of information as well. Um, which is critical. So there's lots of interesting use cases out there for this technology. Um, 
but then let's let's talk about sort of the the expertise so the the idea is when we're building these knowledge bases we don't want it to be manual um there might be in some cases like data that we just want to put up as knowledge uh, but we can use artificial intelligence to understand and do of that correlation of common terms or documents that look similar to each other and have the same information in them so we can really use that uh, automation to surface up these these knowledge or topic cards that we'll talk to, talk about in a second um, think of it as like like a wikipedia i guess so if you've ever gone to wikipedia which you probably have is you're able to find relevant information but it's been um it's been created by multiple different authors right it's not done by one person there's people who are continuously updating this and also checking that the information is correct as well and that's really what viva topics is there to do so it's giving the power to your content creators but also enriched by other people in the business that should have access to that information as well When we talk about sort of AI and the way that it's able to ingest that data, uh, if we think about how content is indexed or found or searched by within SharePoint uh, and Exchange, like there's gonna be a correlation of different things. So you get these visualizations to show you the structure. Same as that organization I talked about um, that we were working with last year, they want to build that operating model about you know, where do you go to find information, but what links to manufacturing and um, the kind of product ownership and the engineers that come with that. So we're able to kind of visualize that in there as well. Uh, so employees can learn, you know, where do they go for, in this example, like the constructions operations? How is that relating to other projects that are called Mark 8 or survey intelligence? Where's our partners that we work with? So if you think about this is really, really cool when it comes to new employees coming to the organization, they can quickly view how everything hangs together, which is pretty neat. They also might want to find different expertise. So if you think of a really big global business, I know when, when I was at Microsoft, and, and Becky, you can probably uh, adhere to this as well, like finding individuals, like even in product group across the globe is really hard. So using these technologies to be able to look at, ah, you know, the, the project manager for Viva Topics is uh, Nesta, for example. I can then reach out to them directly to ask them questions, or I might not even have to if this knowledge base is up to date with relevant information, which it does do automatically. Um, so you have these knowledge centers, but also we're able to pick up uh, knowledge cards or, or topic cards, sorry. So these topic cards allow you to underline different business terms automatically or things that the uh, solution or, or the, the Viva Topics has picked up automatically. And you can hover your mouse over those to get these this subset of information from a, from a topics point of view. So in this example, I'm in SharePoint, I'm reading an article and the platform's automatically underlined a certain project that we're working on which is this construction operations. Uh, we get a bit of the kind of synonyms as well that are related to that content, but also the people and other resources, other content that are related to this, just automatically in one place. Oh, and this is across the platform as well, isn't just mm -hmm. SharePoint. But I could also be in uh, Bing, for example, and using things like uh, Bing Search, and then surface up that internal information securely, of course with those, uh, those topic cards. Uh, if I'm in Outlook, then I also get that as well, which we'll jump into a demo in a second. Sorry, Becky. I was gonna say another incentive to use Edge. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no bias. So let's have a look at these topic cards and what they look like in Office. So we're in here in Outlook, uh, the new Outlook as well, if you've not used this. But you can see an email that's being created. Uh, we can see these hashtags as well. So if you're writing an email and you put hashtag and a term in, then if that's related to a topic within the knowledge base, it'll automatically surface up these topic cards. So we've got a native cloud in here. 
So it gives us an idea about what that means within the business. There are also some alternatives names as well, so internal project codes. We can see there's eight people aligned to that cloud initiative project. And there's also um, a number or 10 plus items as well I could scroll down and click on for, for more information. So that's how the correlation is working of that content. Now that content doesn't have to be sat in one SharePoint site. That could be in multiple sites or someone's OneDrive if they've got access and it's shared. So it's bringing all of that information, that knowledge together. So let's show you that in practice. So I'm over here in the email, I'm actually writing an email. And if we do a hashtag team awesome, of course, and we send that to our recipients, when they get that, they're able to hover over it and then they can see that uh, Viva Topics card, which is great. I can also see other resources here as well, like other sites to go to, which is really easy. Um, it's using machine learning as well, so we can provide feedback on these cards. So if it's not giving the right information, uh, we can automatically tune that. So it'll relearn or retrain the model of the types of information that's collected. That's all built in. And you can do that from an end user point of view or as a content manager if you want to do that too. What about Teams, Becky? We can do the same thing in there. So we've got uh, a chat going on here. Uh, we can see that Planet Blue is also hashtagged, and there's a topic card for that. So this is another project, uh, Osprey project, an alternative name. And we can see the, the people related to that, which is neat. We go over to Word, we can see a similar sort of thing. So we could search within Word and also automatically bring up those topic cards, which is pretty neat. Similar sort of thing of using um, Bing Chat Enterprise. So you can Bing and search for information uh, across your estate. And search, by the way, isn't just for M365. You can also do on-premises as well. It can do Azure files and a few other uh, connectors, which is pretty neat. So we can surface up all of this information from wherever it lives. Uh, but if I wanted to go to the dedicated knowledge base in Viva Topics, I can do that as well. So we've renamed this as Infopedia. Um, I can see that this project name is Mark 8, something to do with vehicles and flight controls. OK, and it's also got some alternative names as well. And we could scroll through that again to see other content that's being created that's related to that project, which is pretty neat. So we're going to leave Viva Topics there for a second. I hope that makes sense about how all of that hangs together. Obviously, we're very short on time today. <laughs> But I just wanted to kind of finish off with some of the readiness that you might want to think about when it comes to Microsoft 365 Copilot. Now, Copilot is a chat based solution where you can ask your, your Microsoft platform to do certain things. So it's using things like um, if you've got your notes within uh, OneNote, for example. So if you're on a customer call, you write all your notes out. You can actually get it to summarize and make sense of your notes. But also you could bring that notes into Word and create a proposal from that. So we could use business chat, as we're calling it, uh, to say, hey, here's my notes. This is the template for the proposals I write. I want you to merge the two together in a similar format that I always use for my proposals, and it'll go away and create it for you. The reason why we're highlighting this today is there's a lot of readiness that needs to happen in preparation to bring up the relevant and right information. And that's things like data management. So if you're hoarding everything forever, you know, we can go back and look at the syntax um, archiving capabilities. So we're moving that stuff away. We're making sure that we're classifying and protecting that content if it needs to, to have that. We can also, using Microsoft Syntax, apply uh, retention labels and retention policies to that data. So we can retain information that we need to keep for a period of time. And then we can also defensively delete information automatically or by review if you want to do that too. There's also some readiness as well. You might want to think about, about your tenant. Uh, so think about the sharing that Becky talked about. You know, your end users are empowered to share information internally, and potentially externally as well. So if you've got any anonymous links, 
that are sent outside, you might want to go through and actually call those. So there's some reports to do. Uh, DLP, uh, lots of organizations have played around with this and have it set up, but maybe not enforced. So it might be like a go back motion to ensure that your really business sensitive information is being protected. And uh, also the security capabilities within the platform are also documented and um, evaluated before you turn on more of the, the AI, the co-pilot controls. Any thoughts on that, Becky? You've been very quiet today. Sure. No, I've, in fairness, I think with all of this, like tying it all together, you know, you in, when you talk about purview, you talk about, you know, dis discovery of data before going in, adding that classification, prevent data loss and the governance piece. One of the main things, or the I like to think of the fifth pillar in here, is this discovery, is the usage of that data. Because, you know, it's fantastic being able to say, right, I've got it all, I've, I'm creating, I've got retention, but what am I actually doing other than, you know, just our users' day-to-day -day access to it. As the huge amount of data which you have, you have, it's all knowledge at the end of the day. It's all information which is business relevant. Otherwise, you know, why would it have been created? So being able to pull it out and being able to get those insights, you know, it should be a core priority to most organisations. But of course, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get there. <laughs> But. It is, yeah. Like if you look at the readiness on the Microsoft Docs site, it talks about information protection, but I think it goes a lot further than that to what you're saying. Like finding out whether you've got redundant data should be key, right? That's costing you money. Um, like making sure that you've got the tenant set up in a secure and a compliant way is also key. Um, lots of organizations I deal with, you know, they they have adopted things like ISO 27001 and GDPR, as they should. Um, so making sure that the tenant reflects that, like you're using a shared platform at the end of the day from Microsoft, so they're going to do their part. You also need to do your part when securing the data as well. Yeah, I mean, on closing, going back to the idea, you know, two billion documents a day are added to M365. Mm -hmm. These solutions are, well, we are drifting towards a way in which we're saying, well, we can no longer say we're putting everything in SharePoint. We need to be able to deal with this scale of data. And in terms of like preparing and being able to build that data protection strategy, that needs to be at the full at the forefront of our um, decision making to make sure that we don't end up with a bigger problem than we originally intended. So yeah, exactly, exactly. So what what we're offering at the moment, I know that. Microsoft 365 Copilot isn't out yet. It's imminent, it's coming, right? So if you want to use that technology, great. You should definitely go away and do that, but make sure that you've done your uh, due diligence first of all. So we're helping customers with that sort of readiness report. So we'll analyze some of those aspects that I've got on the screen here, provide you a report and a timeline about what you need to go away and do, and we can help you do that as well. Um, so there might be some potential funding that you can have uh, from Microsoft uh, if you're eligible for that, and we can check, just ask, uh, and then help you onboard this technology in the right way. Okay, just to recap, all the stuff that we talked about today, from discovering the data to securing that, applying automation and knowledge and readiness for, for co-pilots, you know, we've covered quite a lot in a short space of time. Uh, we hope that you uh, you find all of this useful and you're going to go away and, and learn some more. We'll put some links in the slide where that we'll send out as well. But also there's a set of workshops that we can help with. So they're normally kind of four week engagements, very light touch. But we can do that data discovery, analyze DLP or suggest what type of rules you need to set up and also enable things like insider risk analytics. So it's going to give you an idea of the types of things that's been happening in your organization the last 30 days, wouldn't that be cool? Uh, and then we provide a recommendation report. What's the impact that we're seeing on your estate to get you ready around data security? So we do all of that as well. Um, I just want to kind of leave it there. I just want to say thank you very much, Becky, for your time and your insights, always amazing. And you as the viewers as well, thanks for attending today. Uh, if you have any final questions, feel free to unmute or use the Q&A window and uh, we'll be around to answer them. Thanks very much.